Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. My attention, but she thinks I forget everything, Grace does. I don't forget everything. I know her birthday's coming up. I'm, our anniversary's just around the corner. Praise God. And right now, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, dismiss our Aspire kids. So to go on out. So let's give the Aspire kids a big hand clap today. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We appreciate uh, our young ones here today. Can you say amen? I always say that. Can you say amen? Because that means agreement. I want you to agree with me. I don't want to be the only one that cares about the church. We should all care about each other. And I know that you believe that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. One more hand clap for the kids, the young ones. (laughs) Praise God. Today I want you to open your Bibles up into the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, please. Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter. The title of our message today is a simple one. It's the prodigal son and the elder brother. And we want to just read this passage out of Luke chapter 15 and verse 28. Luke chapter 15. You'll remember that the younger son in the story, that starts actually at uh, verse 11, uh, you'll read about this younger son, and the story is primarily focused on that young son. He's called the prodigal. Prodigal means a reckless or wasteful kid, and he just kind of threw his life away, and you'll, you'll remember that. He uh, was misguided by his own wants. He had desires in his heart, and he wanted it like a lot of young people, a lot of old people too. I want it now. I don't want to wait. And he takes off with his inheritance and basically ruins his life, at least for a time. And, you know, i got to tell all my young brothers and sisters here today that your parents sometimes, I know they can be old, and I know they can be uh, maybe not with it. Maybe they don't understand exactly what you're going through, but they have your best intentions. They have good intentions towards you. They have your your best uh, uh, thoughts for you, and they're trying their best to keep you from going the wrong direction that could bring all kinds of catastrophe to your life. His life runs into a wall and eventually he comes to his senses. And we'll remember that. It's a story of how God is there to help us when we come back. And the grace is there for God. If you're far from God today, there's some people in this place today, you're not serving God, let's be honest. You're not really a Christian. You you might know about Christianity and your family may tell you you're still a Christian, but you know you're not. You know, you can come back. And that's good news. You can come back, not just to church. Church is important, but come back to Jesus. And that's what the Bible is speaking about here with this prodigal son. Father receives him with open arms. But then there's the elder brother, the elder brother. And we're going to read it in just a second. And I was, as I read the passage, I thought, it's always the elder brother. It's always him that's causing trouble. I'm the older brother. My brother passed away already a number of years ago. But I was the older brother, and I I always was mad at him because the younger one always gets away with everything. It's true. And and I think, uh, you know, my my favorite child, she's the youngest. (laughs) And and, and you know why she gets away with everything? Because she learned from the older ones. She learned how to hide. (laughs) She learned how to make sure I didn't know what was going on or her mom didn't know what was going on. And so the elder brothers are always upset. Elder, elder siblings are always feeling upset at the young one. Why do you let her? Why do you let him? And so here in verse 28, the Bible says, the elder brother became angry and refused to go in. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. 
my son, the father said. You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord, today that you would teach us, you would instruct us, you would deal with us. I pray for those who are far from you today, Lord God, you would turn their hearts towards home. I'm asking, Lord God, for those who need uh, to make steps back into the flow of ministry and the flow of what you're doing. I pray for them today. I bind the devil's strategy. God, I pray that all of us would be strong and that we would walk firmly in the word of the Lord. Ask that I would decrease and just deliver your word as you see fit. Use my personality as you see fit, Lord God. Speak to us all in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. It's plain to see in the reading of the text that this elder brother is giving his father some some lip, as we say in L.A., as uh, giving him some attitude, as young people might say. He was upset. He didn't have a problem just mouthing off to his father. Disrespectful, wasn't he? Disrespectful, and unfortunately, that's the way when people are in the mode that the elder brother is. They're disrespectful to people around them and disrespectful towards God. They may not see it in the moment, but that's where they're at. We see that this elder brother had become the person that we're talking about. He wasn't always like this. He wasn't always in the mode or in the shape that we see him in in the story. At other parts of his life, he was in a different attitude, a better attitude, a good frame of mind. Some of you that are watching online today, you may be able to relate to that as well. You've been at places in your life where you were joyous serving God. You had good attitude. Nothing bothered you. But then all of a sudden, circumstances, situations occurred. Uh, something rubbed you the wrong way. You didn't like something that was said or done to you or around you or to somebody else. And you developed, you became uh, like the elder brother. Maybe not exactly, but maybe you can relate to this similarity of becoming something. And not to get too hippie-ish on you. You know how hippies, they can be like, whoa, man not talking about that, but I do want to say we're all becoming something. You're becoming something. We don't look at our lives like that. We think we're just living. We think we're just developing. We're just uh, coming to church. We're just working a job. We're just being a family member, whatever it is that we are, but we're becoming, we're developing into some sort of person, either good or bad, either godly or not, either strong or weak. See, if you're lazy now, You'll be lazy in the future. If every day you give, get up and you do less work than the day before, you're becoming lazier. If you're greedy now, don't think that someday when you get a pile of money, then I'm going to really not be greedy. No, if you're greedy now, you'll be greedy then. You're developing, you're becoming. That's what this older brother was going through in his life. See, if you're worldly now, one day you're not going to get less worldly. Some young people think this, well, right now I'm going to party, you know, right now I'm going to have a good time, right now I'm just going to do whatever feels good or comes natural to me. There's always time to serve God. Let me tell you, it gets harder as you get older to come to the Lord. I know you view everybody over the age of 30 as boring and have no life and no fun, but I want to tell you, we're trying to do it all. We're trying to have fun, work a job, take care of people and take care of others at the same, take care of our family and others at the same time. My point is, You're becoming something. This man had become something. He was a young man, but he was still a man. You might be a teenager, but you're still an adult in a sense because you're maturing and becoming who God wants you to be. So what had this elder brother become? The first thing he became was frustrated. He was frustrated at his circumstances, and that caused him to be stubborn. It caused him to be angry. Can I tell you that frustration, anger, is the worst kind of anger you can have. I've had all kinds of anger in my life. Some people say, wow, you're pretty angry. Maybe. (laughs) But I want to tell you, I've had anger that was righteous anger. Like, no, you're not going to do that to the church. I'm sorry, you can't act like that in here. 
I've had anger that just came from carnality and rage. You've had that as well. But then I've had anger that was frustration because from frustration, where I was frustrated at the way things were going, either in my life or in my work or whatever it was that I was involved in. And it's a tough one. And you have to remember that when you're in frustration, it's hard to remember, but you need to, is that it's only temporary. Think of the things that you acted out in frustration. You lashed out. You said something. And it was only a temporary situation. It wasn't permanent. Why did you get so angry? Because of that feeling of frustration. But we also see something interesting. It says he became angry and then he refused to go into the party. The father was pleading with him. The father represents God. So it's like God saying, come into the celebration. I want you to come into the party. I want you to be part of this. He refused. He was stubborn. He wasn't going to do it. You know, there are people in here that are stubborn this morning. Say, wow, why are you talking about me like that? Not me, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. If it's just me, then it's not going to make much difference. But if it's the Holy Spirit, you better listen. And so the point is, is that stubbornness uh, happens to people in, when they get to the place that they're frustrated. And then they begin to make changes in their life, changes in their character and in their attitude. We see Demas in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10 It says, Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. It's because Demas loved a party and so he moved to London. He heard there was a better club life down there, a better life, something greater was going to happen. I'm going to move abroad. I'm going to go to the States. I'm going to do something different. Things are going to be great for me. That's what Demas thought. This elder brother, he wasn't there yet, but he was on his way to becoming like that. Because when you become stubborn and refuse to yield to what God is speaking to you about, I've got to tell you, worldliness is not far off. The world without Christ. You know, when you first arrive in that new place, once you've left God and everything's going to be good, you think everything's going to be good, it feels good at first, a little bit like freedom. I remember when I was a teenager, I had a young teenager, early teens. I had been invited to a Christian church. And I went to the church uh, youth group that they had there. And it was moving. It was touching. And I remember I liked it. And we ate McDonald's and played volleyball. So it was like, I'll go for the food. That's why at our youth things, I always say, we've got to have food because people come for the food. And I liked it. And then I remember going to a special meeting that they had. And I forget what the guy was talking about, but he made an altar call and said, come to Jesus. And, you know, I just felt like I wanted to come. I stood up and I went forward and I prayed a sinner's prayer. I remember being touched. Something drastically happened in my life. But it became a battle because I didn't have a good church. I didn't have anybody around me, really, at that time. And plus, I was just kind of rebellious, like some of you. And I remember I got to the point where... I finally said, you know, that's it. I'm not going to battle back and forth. Because I had Christian friends that were trying to bring me to church, but I also had dope-using friends, drug-using friends that were always trying to get me to do some drugs with them. So I was battling, be here with these friends, and then I'd go with my other friends who wanted to smoke a little weed and drop a little bit of this and that. And I remember, like, battling, and I was frustrated. I was in between. I felt like Demas... And I remember deciding, you know what, that's it, forget it. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm just going to be who I want to be. And I remember I just hung out with the druggies. I just hung out with the party animals. And it felt good at first, but it ruined my life. It ruined my life. If it wasn't for Jesus coming into, if it wasn't for Gracie giving her life to Christ many years later, decade later, I wouldn't be here today. But the point I'm trying to tell you is there's that draw, that pull of where you're in between. And that's how this elder brother was acting. He was angry that his younger brother had come back. How ridiculous is that? But this is what happens when you're religious but far from God. Because, yeah, he was doing all the right things. He was serving. He says, I was obedient. 
But you can be obedient and not be in his presence. You can be doing the things that are required of you. Some of you church kids know that. You've been in church a long time. You know how to go through. You know how to keep your parents off your back. But that's not what being a Christian is all about. That's just keeping your parents off their, your back. See, I've got to tell you that he was angry. He had become frustrated, angry, and stubborn, and far from God. As I said earlier, he was obedient, and no doubt uh, that aspect of his life he was proud of. The fact that he was obedient, that he had done all these things. He says, hey, I've been doing this for many years, doing all that you ask of me. But he did it with this word that I want you to catch. He did it grudgingly. It was like he was almost forced into doing it. He even began to call it slavery. It's so sad when people are forced to do something. I never ever force people to come to church. I invite people to come to church. I invite them to come in. I invite them to be part, of, but I'm not going to force you because if you're doing it grudgingly, your attitude is wrong. That's how this elder brother was. And he was really, really sounding now. He was supposed to be the mature one because he was the elder, but he was acting like an immature kid, wasn't he? He's all, I'm your slave. Whatever you want, that's what I do. I'm your slave. He's an immature attitude. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I, my parents would give me chores to do. So like your parents did. They weren't hard. And by today's standard, if that's all I had to do in my life, woohoo! I wish that's all I had to do. But I remember complaining. And I remember my dad telling me, you know what? This is not a democracy in this house. This is a dictatorship, and I'm your dictator. Whatever I say, that's what you do. <laughs> I've got to tell you, that's good parenting right there. <laughs> that's good parenting. And this is how he was. He was probably frustrated because he says in the King James Version, he goes, lo, these many years I have served you. It's almost as if he was upset and thought of it as slavery, being a, a servant in the house as slavery, because he wasn't seeing the reward. Some of you that have dropped out of ministry, some of you that have decided ministry is not for you, some of you that thought about ministry but pulled back, some of you that are in ministry but barely doing it, you're, you're not seeing the reward you want. So it, it's causing your heart to be shifted into something else. I want to tell you, you're in line with this elder brother. This is where he was. Say, so you can get angry, but it's not about me. It's about you and the word of God and Jesus. And we can come up with a list, a laundry list of why it doesn't apply to us. But Lo, these many years, I've slaved away, haven't seen a reward. And this young punk comes trotting into the house backslidden, doing all the wrong things. And what do you do? You give him a cow. You didn't even give me a goat. <laughs> you threw him a party. You did nothing for me. What a bad attitude. What a bad attitude. What a non-Christian attitude. Christ gave his life for both of them. And yet he forgot that. It was all about this guy was getting the blessing now. He was missing out on what God was doing. Can you say Amen. He sounded a little bit bored to me. Sounded a little bit bored. Like he was bored with the whole thing. Like, yeah, I've been here, done that. Been doing this forever, man. But it's the same old, same old. I'm going to move on to something else. You know, can I tell you, routine, uh, while sometimes it can be rough and we don't like routine and it can get boring, but routine is an important thing, isn't it? You know, you want your refrigerator to work every day. You don't want it to say, hey, you know, I'm going to change it up today and I'm not going to work. You don't want that. You don't want to go in and, uh, you know, you have an appointment with your GP and your GP say, oh, well, hey, look, at I, to, normally I work today, but routine has kind of got me down. So I'm going to go out and hit a few at the golf course. You know, I'm, I'm going to go kick the football. You, you don't want it. You want the routine. You don't want to show up at the shop that you normally go to and it's open from 9 to 5 and you show up at 4 and you go, oh, well, we change our hours just for today, maybe tomorrow. We don't know. We'll let you know. You don't want that. Routine 
is an important thing. But yet, truth is, routine in church, in God, in Jesus, can sometimes lead to boredom. Can lead to boredom. You know, one thing about church kids, kids that have been in church a long time, they get in ministry, and, and, and you all will know this is true. Many of you got in ministry just because it was boring just sitting in church. <laughs> it was better if you got to do something. Better if you played an instrument. Better if you played, uh, 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 b- tapped on the computer. Better if you set up the chairs. It felt funner. It was funner. It was less boring. And I, I'm not criticizing you for that, but I'm telling you it has to advance from that, the lack of boredom, into a heart for God, doesn't it? And so this guy was probably a little bit bored. Maybe he really wasn't as faithful as he made out to be. You know what I found through the years is that some people, and if this shoe fits, go ahead and feel free to wear it, uh, that you know, some people aren't quite as faithful as they acted. You know, they're not quite as committed as they thought. It looked good on the outside, but when the push comes to shove, when the rubber meets the road, when the doo-doo hit the fan, (laughs) some of you are like, I'm so offended. (laughs) Okay, elder brother. When that happens, see, that's when you really find out who's who. That's when you really find out what's what. And I'm not talking about I find out or the other people find out what you're all about. You find out who you really are. Because you know the worst thing in the world is not when people think less of you, but when you're not satisfied with your own self. When you know you should be doing something that you're not doing. When you know you should be at a certain caliber of Christian and you're not. I'm not telling you you have to be at any level of Christianity. That is between you and God. But I want to tell you, if God called you to be here and you're here, man, you are miserable. You're miserable. That's where this elder brother was at. The thing that we see is that he was exaggerating about himself and his brother. Now, I just want to make clear that exaggeration isn't all, isn't all exaggeration isn't created equal. There's some exaggeration that we call hyperbole. It's where you use exaggeration to make a point. It's like when you begin to say things like, uh, I laughed so hard I thought I was going to die. You know, you weren't really going to die, but you were making a point that you really laughed hard. You might say, well, that person is the worst driver in Manchester. Well, they're not the literal worst driver in Manchester, but they drove so badly in your opinion that you called them the worst driver in Manchester. It's hyperbole. It's exaggeration. But then there is harmful forms of exaggeration, which is where you lift people, lift yourself up high because you think of yourself as more than you should. You, you, you think of this and you exaggerate. And you use exaggeration to make yourself into something that you're not. This is what the elder brother did. And we're all prone to this because you know why? There's that root of pride in each person here. <laughs> raise your hand. No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> And uh, the other part is that you put other people down so that you look better. Well, I don't like the way that they are. Or they're like this. Or I would be serving, but they're like that. I would be doing this, but it's because of them. That's exaggeration. That's exaggeration. Because if it's real, if it's legit, sit down and have a talk about it, right? So my point is here is that this elder brother, he had become an exaggerator in his life. He was no longer down to earth. He was no longer talking real business here, as we say. He exaggerates. says, yeah, he wasted all his money on prostitutes. We don't know if he was with prostitutes. No, no uh, listing of that at all. But the point is, is that he is proud, self-centered, has a superior attitude. You know, when churches begin to have too many people with this type of elder brother attitude, it repels new people from coming in. It it, it does. I've I've been a Christian a long time. I've pastored lots of different sized churches. And I'm not saying we're like this, but we can become like this. And I just want to tell you, because people will walk in looking for help, 
looking for hope. They're nervous. They don't know what to do. They feel weird. Uh, They're not really like in with the program. They don't know what Aspire Church is or what it went through to get here or why it's doing. And if everybody were, then what's going to happen is people will just be repelled by that. And see, the, the tendency is to, uh, or the, the problem is, is the tendency within people who have elder brother mentality is because nothing has really happened big in a while. Something hasn't grand. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be warm when, when, when loads of people come in. You need to be warm to the one. You need to be warm to the people that have been coming forever. You need to be warm to that person that you didn't get along with. This is what the attitude that is necessary this superior attitude. See, because, and, and I don't want to rant on this, but I'm going to say one thing, then I'm moving on. Is that you can get to the attitude where, like, they need me. The elder brother was like that. This family needs me. He's like, I do all the work around here. He's out partying. He's got his chicks and all his things going on over here. He's smoking dope off to the side and hanging out with the pigs, you know, doing whatever. I'm here doing all the work. And see, it can become like that. If it wasn't for me and my family, this church would be nothing. We'd never get nothing. You, you, you might be right. You might be right. Your money may be helping pay the bills. Your, your effort may be building the church. You're right. You, if you were gone, there'd be a big gap. But where you're wrong is that you think you're irreplaceable. You think that, that that's what the kingdom of God is all about. You think the kingdom of God is about money or work that you do or all that. I want to tell you something. Thank God you get to work. Thank God you get to be in ministry. Thank God you have money to give. Thank God that you get to support the work of God. All of that should be counted as a blessing. This elder brother had totally lost that that concept in his life. Don't let it be you. So if we are looking at this elder brother on his own, out of the greater context of the story, we would miss something important about God. So I want to just look at one final thing that's important, and that's this issue of the Father. Of the Father. See, the elder brother, apart from the actions of the Father, would be simply a monster. Simply a monster. Just an arrogant, self-centered, demanding, prima donna brother who thinks he's better than everybody. It'd be horrible just to have a house full of people like that, wouldn't it? It'd be horrible just to have the kingdom of God filled with people like that. But the actions of his father change the whole scenario. See, in spite of all this show of immaturity and rebellion... See, and he was trying to point to the younger son as being rebellious because the younger son said, give me the money, you know, give me my inheritance. I'm going to go out and party and do what I want. And he comes back with his tail between his legs uh, and, you know, probably still had the smell of pigs on him. Uh, and the father had to run out and greet him. And so it would be very easy for the elder son to say, he's the rebellious one. But I dare tell you today, I think the elder son was more rebellious than the younger son. Because he had what the younger son had in his own heart, but never said it. Never exposed it, never dealt with it, pretended falsely to live out a life. Father demonstrated love and grace towards the prodigal, didn't he? You know, and sometimes that's the problem. That's how we develop this elder brother mentality is because we know that the father is loving and graceful. We know that he's always going to forgive us. We know that he's always going to be there. And so that's why sometimes we just walk around the kingdom of God like no big deal. I'm telling you, we've lost the fear of God once we get like that. We've lost the fact that we have reverence for God. You can tell by the way that this elder brother, yeah, he had all his ducks in a row. He obeyed. He was there. He never left his father's side, never went out to the pigsty, blah, blah, blah. But I got to tell you, his lipping off to his father was totally rebellious. And sometimes that's how people who've been in church a long time can become towards God. They forget about the grace that they experienced when they first came to Jesus. I know it's hard to always remember, but we must. 
We know that this grace this father demonstrated not only to the prodigal, but also to the elder son. If you're acting like an elder son here today, I want to tell you this grace that can be extended to you. Look at how he addressed the elder son. He calls him my son. He doesn't say the younger one's my son and you're just somebody else. He says, my son. He wasn't acting like a son. As a matter of fact, the rebellious son was acting more like a son than the elder son was. But nevertheless, the father didn't change his heart one bit. He still called him my son. He makes this statement. He says, you were always with me. And this is, to me, is a bit shocking because you look at how the elder son was acting. He wasn't acting like he was in a relationship with the father. He wasn't acting like he was serving God. He wasn't acting like he was obedient to the Lord. But yet, nevertheless, the father who represents God was saying, hey, you're always with me. This shows who's, his proactiveness of being, uh, uh, going after relationships with his loved ones, with the ones that he cares about. You remember when the prodigal son was coming back home, the Bible says that he ran towards him. He was proactive. I want to tell you today, you might have a bad attitude. You might be rejecting everything I say. You might think, oh, yeah, I've heard this before, been there, done that. I want to tell you, God is still proactive towards you. His love and grace is not something that's stagnant. It's not just standing in the corner when you're ready. He's going after you. He's trying to chase you down. As a matter of fact, it's coming pretty soon for some of you. You're going to see some actions in your life that's going to prove that God is relentless towards you. But you're going to interpret it like, why is all this happening to me? Why is all this bad stuff happening to me? It's because God is showing his love and grace and calling you back. That job you thought was going to do it for you, you're going to find it's not going to be as good as you thought. That cutie pie that you were, got your eye on, you think that's the one. I don't see no fine girls like that in my church, but I found one at work. I see one on the play yard, and I'm a player. <laughs> oh, man. You, you know, when we went to America and brought Lillian and Marianne and Janet and went to preaching, they go, Pastor, we never seen you preach like that. That's because when I'm around ghetto people, man, that ghetto comes out. With you, I'm still kind of a little posh, you know, but... My point being is that you think that that girl's going to do it for you or that guy's going to do it for you? Man, you know how many cute couples have broke up? You know how many relationships where he was hot, she was hot, they were this, they were that, and they end up hating each other? <laughs> because only real love comes from God. And then he says, everything I have is yours. Wow, that just blows my mind. I was shocked when the rebellious son that was out, the prodigal son was out, and he comes back, and he puts the robe, and he puts everything on him, and all that. I thought, man, he gave it to this guy who was bad. Then I read about the elder son. I said, that's even more shocking. He deserves it even less than the prodigal son. But yet it's still there, and that tells us that God's love is still available for us. His riches are still available for us. Don't play games. Uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, trying to get a bad word out of my head. Uh, <laughs> I, I know you guys don't ever get bad words stuck in your head, do you? I don't say them, but I think them. <laughs> but my point is, is that you may be looking at God. Don't, don't, don't mess with God's goodness is what I'm trying to get across. He loved him and never retracted his gifts. The Bible says his gifts and calling are without repentance. It means he doesn't change his mind. Now, you can reject those gifts and callings. You can walk away from that. But God says, no, I'm still here. When you're done playing, come home. And they're not saying that it's always going to be available because you could die before you get home. You could miss it before you get home. But if you want God's love today, you can have his love today. You want his mercy today, you can have it today. If you want to repent from your foul attitude, you can do it today. That's good. Say, why do you keep saying things like that? Why? Because that's real life. Because what you call just being you is foul in the atmosphere of God. Hmm. You got to remember, I don't live with any of you. So I don't have a little camera in your house. 
I've been queried doing so well. You've been doing this, this, and that. These are things God lays on my heart. I put them down on paper, and sometimes I preach them. This one, I didn't want to preach it. I, 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 I didn't want to deal with this. I, I don't, this isn't fun for me. But on the other hand, I just want to tell you that it's so important because God is calling us to reach lost people. He's calling us to reach the prodigals of the world. But if we're all a bunch of elder brothers, it's never going to work. You're causing trouble in your own home because of your elder brother attitude. Your siblings are, are starting to feel it and starting to experience it because of how you're acting. And you may say, well, there's no way I can get back. There, I'm, I've come too far. You know, I've done too many things wrong. I have too bad of an attitude in this. I want to tell you, you, you misunderstand God's power. I don't care how uh, deep you've dug your pit. God's arm is not so short that he cannot save you from that pit. He can. See, this morning as we close, whether you've run your life into a wall like the prodigal son, run amok, as we say, and come back to a father with a repentant heart, he'll receive you. Maybe you have religious, superior attitude of the elder brother. Can you come to him today? He'll receive you. And if it has anything to do with the church, hey, we'll receive you. We'll receive you. I, I, we've got a lot of issues here at Aspire Church, but one thing we are is forgiving. We can, we can let it go, overlook. Can you? Can you? Let's give the Lord a big hand clap today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today at Aspire Church. If the message today has blessed you, or there's something we can help you with, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk We meet in different locations throughout the week, and if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you visit us. You can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk Or if you'd like further information, find us on Facebook, look us up on Twitter. We also live stream all of our services and once again if you'd like to view online you can find all the details on our website. Thank you for joining us today, being part of our ministry. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.